Thank you, Eileen. And as Eileen said, I'm here today um, in my capacity as chair of the Health Committee. And firstly, can I offer you all a very warm welcome um, to Parliament Buildings. I see some faces here that I recognise that are frequent flyers of Parliament Buildings. Uh, anybody that's new here, you're very welcome. And you're very welcome to this CAS seminar, which addresses very sensitive and complex issues uh, relating to abortion policy and law here in Northern Ireland. As chair of the Health Committee, I would like to make it clear that the committee has not agreed a position on the issues that are going to be discussed here. The committee has written to the department requesting an update regarding progress of its working group on fatal fetal abnormality. As we all know, in Northern Ireland, the Offences Against the Person Act 1861 provides for the prohibition of procuring a miscarriage and the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Act 1945 provides for the crime of child destruction, but also provides for termination where the mother's life is at risk or there is serious risk to her physical or mental health. While the Abortion Act 1967, which provides for defences for doctors to carry out an abortion under specified circumstances, does not extend here in Northern Ireland. Guidance issued in March 1916 by the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, now just the Department of Health, states that termination of pregnancy is lawful in Northern Ireland only where it is necessary to preserve the life of the woman or there is risk of real and serious adverse effect on her physical or mental health, which is either long term or permanent. This, this September, an Assembly member has stated his intention to bring forward legislation that will seek to legalise abortion in Northern Ireland in cases of fatal fetal abnormalities. It follows a previous unsuccessful attempt in February 2016 when the Assembly voted down a proposal, a proposed legislative amendment to change the law in this regard. It was brought forward by the then Justice Minister, who is the same member currently seeking to introduce legislative proposals. Prior to this, in November 2015, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission successfully brought a just judicial review to challenge the law in this area in Northern Ireland. The High Court's judgment will be explained by Dr Catherine McNeely of Queen's University, who has published widely on the legal and human rights dimensions of abortion. Catherine will be exploring the issue from the perspective of the European Convention on Human Rights, following the High Court's determination of incompatibility with Article 8. In my committee capacity, such a presentation will help to inform Assembly consideration of this judgment. This is important given that the judgment left it to the Assembly to interpret its findings. In addition to Catherine, Dr Fiona Bloomer of Ulster University and Dr Claire Pearson of Manchester Metropolitan University will make presentations that examine the evidence used in political debate on abortion in Northern Ireland. Fiona has carried out extensive research in areas of social policy and Claire has explored through her work gender dimensions of politics and policy in Northern Ireland. Thereafter, the Open University's Dr Leslie Hogarth and Professor Sally Sheldon of Kent University will discuss the research evidence of young women's experiences of unintended pregnancy and abortion throughout the United Kingdom. Leslie's background is in studies of reproductive and sexual health and Sally's research areas are healthcare, law and ethics. We are delighted to have your collective expertise with us today and we look forward to what you have to say, as well as to the discussion that will follow the presentations when different opinions and perspectives have an opportunity to be expressed and exchanged. As Eileen has already said, and I want to reiterate, I would respectfully ask that although you may not agree with opinions, views or research findings expressed by someone here today, please ensure you respect the rights of others to have an opportunity to present and to comment or ask questions. It is important that no one shouts across anyone and the discussion can be extended if needed and I believe it might be a lively discussion and I just want to thank you again for attending and I thank you in advance for your cooperation on this and as Eileen had said sadly I have other engagements and I have to leave but I know Eileen um, will get back to me uh, and let me know how today's proceedings have gone as, long as, other, as well as other MLAs that I see in the room. So thank you very much and uh, now over to your speakers. So, thank
Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Catherine McNeely, and I'm here today to speak on the European Convention on Human Rights and cases of fetal fetal abnormality and uh, sexual crime. So in this presentation, I want to consider the 2015 judicial review decision, which deemed the current legal framework for abortion in Northern Ireland incompatible with Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights in cases of fetal fetal abnormality and sexual crime. And I want to introduce some research that myself and colleagues have been undertaking over the past six months with healthcare professionals that suggests the current position in Northern Ireland may require consideration under another article of the European Convention, and that is Article 3. So I will outline why, uh, the, why the research is pointing towards this direction and the consequences that this may have. So to begin with, to provide some background on the judicial review decision itself. As I'm sure uh, many of you are aware, last year the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission brought judicial review proceedings uh, asserting that the current legal framework in Northern Ireland for abortion is incompatible with human rights commitments in three circumstances. So firstly, fetal fetal abnormality, FFA, serious fetal malformation, and thirdly, pregnancy following sexual crime. In November 2015, the Northern Ireland High Court uh, ruled that prohibition of abortion in two of those situations, FFA and sexual crime, violated UK human rights commitments, specifically Article 8, which is the right to private and family life. As a result, a declaration of incompatibility was made, placing the onus on the Northern Ireland Assembly to introduce remedial legislative reform. And the case has been heard on appeal by the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal, and judgment is awaited uh, from the court. So in terms of what the European Court of Human Rights itself has said in relation to Article 8, the court has found a violation of Article 8 in a number of cases pertaining to restrictive legal frameworks for abortion. So for example, Tysiak in Poland, ABC in Ireland, RR in Poland, and PNS in Poland. So in holding that the current framework in Northern Ireland is in violation of Article 8, the Northern Ireland High Court in many ways was on well-trodden ground. However, it's important to note that in its application, the Human Rights Commission also alleged that two additional uh, rights in the Convention were uh, in violation, and that is Article 14, the right to non-discrimination, and Article 3, and this is the article that I want to focus on uh, today. So in terms of what Article 3 is, uh, I've listed it on the slide there. Article 3 of the Convention prohibits torture. It says that no one shall be subjected to torture or inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. This provision differs slightly from Article 8 in that it is an absolute right, meaning that states cannot derogate from it or qualify it under any circumstances. So in terms of what the European Court of Human Rights has said about Article 3, the court has made clear that in order for acts or omissions of a state to incur liability under Article 3, a minimum level of severity must be met. An assessment to determine whether this minimum level has been reached is relative. So it's dependent on the circumstances of the case, including the duration of the treatment in question, its physical and mental effects, and in some cases, the sex, age, and state of health of the victim in question. And the European Court of Human Rights has indeed found that this minimum level of severity has been met in two cases of restrictive access to abortion. And this is the cases of RR in Poland and P and S in Poland. So in these cases, both Article 8 and Article 3 were found to be violated by the court. So it's useful in discussing the Article 3 context in Northern Ireland to briefly give you an indication of the facts of these two cases, just outline what they were about. RR in Poland, firstly, was a case relating to fetal abnormality. The applicant in this case was refused genetic testing during her pregnancy to confirm a, a suspected genetic abnormality. The applicant went to various doctors, clinics, and hospitals. Uh, she expressed her views and her desire for these tests in writing as well as orally, uh, but to no avail. 
So eventually the time limit uh, within which she could have accessed legal uh, healthcare services expired and the applicant went on to have a child who was born with Turner syndrome. So the European court in this case determined that that treatment had met the minimum level of severity uh, to violate Article 3. The court observed that the applicant had tried repeatedly and with perseverance uh, through numerous visits to doctors and clinics uh, to obtain access to the testing. Uh, she uh, was repeatedly sent to various hospitals, including hospitals uh, far from her home. And the court found that the, the treatment of the applicant was marred by procrastination, confusion, and a lack of, of adequate information given to her. And in particular, the court noted what they observed as the situation of vulnerability that this applicant was in, and emphasized that no regard had been had to the temporal nature of her predicament. So in finding that Article 3 was violated in this case, the court made clear that the intention of the treatment, while one factor to be taken into consideration, is not a determinant of whether there has been an Article 3 violation or not. So PNS in Poland is a contrasting case. This case involved pregnancy following sexual crime. The applicant in this case was a teenage girl who had been uh, subject to rape by a peer. She went to a hospital to seek termination services, which she was entitled to under law. However, she uh, was refused access by the chief medical professional of the hospital. She was also sent to discuss with a priest who uh, sought to discourage her from seeking the treatment and also took her telephone number, which was disclosed to third parties. The applicant then went to a second hospital to receive the treatment who were willing to provide it. However, uh, pressure was subsequently put on them by the media and various lobbying groups. The applicant was discharged and later was put into a juvenile centre. She eventually was able to access the healthcare services in another location. However, subsequently, uh, the applicant was subject to criminal investigation on the charge of unlawful uh, underage sexual intercourse. So again, the European Court determined that this treatment did meet the minimum level of severity to engage Article 3. Again, the court said the applicant was in a great situation of vulnerability. The doctors had sought to influence her decision. Uh, she was required to speak to a priest, which resulted in significant emotional pressure being put on her. And the court found that ap the authorities had not protected her from emotional distress. And indeed, they had gone further to place her into a juvenile institution and also undertake criminal investigations against her. And the court was particularly struck on this latter point, saying that in order to be Article 3 compliant, a criminal justice system should uh, not punish victims of sexual abuse. So in these two cases, the European Court of Human Rights has made clear that it cannot be excluded that uh, acts and omissions of authorities in the field of healthcare policy may in certain circumstances engage responsibility under Article 3. So how was Article 3 engaged in Northern Ireland? Well, the Northern Ireland High Court determined that Article 3 had not been violated by our current legal framework. And in considering the treatment in question, Justice Horner, in delivering his decision, discussed, about, uh, discussed the requirement to travel. So patients experiencing FFA and sexual crime have to travel to Great Britain to access healthcare services. Uh, and as you can see from the quote in the, the slide, uh, the court determined that the additional stress of travel uh, to Great Britain did not satisfy the minimum level of severity to engage Article 3. However, despite this finding of the High Court, evidence has emerged through research recently undertaken that this may not be all there is to consideration of Article 3 in Northern Ireland. So this is what I want to outline uh, to you now. So first of all, what is the research? Well, the research was undertaken by the Reproductive Health Law and Policy Advisory Group which is a collaborative initiative between myself at Queen's University Belfast and colleagues Dr. Fiona Bloomer at Ulster University and Dr. Claire Pearson at Manchester Metropolitan University. 
The group was established in 2016 to provide expertise and knowledge on policy and legal matters pertaining to reproductive health broadly. And in June 2016, the group undertook a roundtable uh, with specialist healthcare practitioners working across the health and social care trusts in Northern Ireland and also in Great Britain. The aim of this roundtable was to explore uh, experiences of the current legal framework for healthcare professionals in relation to FFA and sexual crime and to consider potential ways for moving forward in this area. So significant for the purposes of discussion today, a number of issues emerged from this research indicating that the current legal position in Northern Ireland may require further consideration under Article 3. There are a number of issues that our participants highlighted that mirror similar issues that I've just mentioned in those cases of RR in Poland and PNS in Poland. So I want to outline four of these issues, four issues that our participants highlighted that indicate Article 3 may need to be considered further in Northern Ireland. So the first issue our participants appointed towards was a current lack of clarity and standardisation amongst healthcare professionals on what the law is and how to apply it in cases of FFA and sexual crime. While participants identified the 2016 departmental guidance document as an improvement in helping healthcare professionals carry out their work, and indeed an improvement on previous iterations of this document, the view was expressed that complete clarity on the law in this area has not yet been achieved. A significant reason for this appears to be attributable to differences in communication of the guidelines, both across departments, also across health and social care trusts, and uh, to all levels of staff. In addition, in relation to application of the law, divergences in approach also still exist. For example, on the issue of mental health assessment, so to determine whether a patient falls within the, the category of mental and physical rack and therefore may be entitled to treatment, a divide exists amongst obstetricians. Our participants highlighted that some feel very capable of making a mental health assessment, uh, while others uh, particularly they observe those earlier in their practice, feel ill-equipped to make such an assessment without specific training on the issue. So these difficulties are leading to a misinformation and a lack of consistency of healthcare services across the province, which can result in enhanced distress for patients who are experiencing FFA or pregnancy following sexual crime. And this links into the facts that I highlighted to you in RR in Poland, where the misinformation and a lack of readily available, misinform mis uh, available information was highlighted by the court as, as problematic for the applicant and relevant to the Article 3 consideration. The second issue highlighted by our participants was the current lack of formal referral pathways from Northern Ireland to Great Britain with aftercare services. Where a patient experiencing fatal fetal abnormality or pregnancy following sexual crime is seeking an abortion service which cannot be provided for in Northern Ireland, healthcare professionals expressed a concern regarding the lack of official referral pathways. So to a significant extent, pathways for referral remain uh, dependent on what particular healthcare professional and health and social care trust care is being received from. Again, while participants expressed that this situation has improved in recent years, it's still not possible to make a direct referral uh, for services in Great Britain. Such lack of pathways, our participants felt, heightens practical and emotional difficulties for patients and also means that aftercare services are not readily available. I should note that standardised pathways on this issue are currently being considered uh, and will be implemented, it is hoped, uh, shortly. In relation to patients who travel to seek abortion in cases of FFA specifically, 
there is currently no pathway for the return of fetal remains from Great Britain to Northern Ireland for either burial or autopsy. And participants described how patients are often required to transport remains themselves, such as via picnic coolers or in hand luggage or by private courier. This raises significant ethical concerns and may uh, add to the trauma that patients in this situation experience. It also leaves patients and families without a practical support provision for them. Again, pathways for the return of fetal remains could be created within a standardised frame. Our participants also highlighted difficulties in relation to the legal aspects of a disposal of fetal remains. And again, information provided to departments and staff could be uh, clarified in this area. So the third issue that our participants highlighted was the current time delay for patients experiencing fetal fetal abnormality and seeking abortion services in Great Britain. Participants expressed concern regarding the currently long waiting times to see a consultant in cases of FFA. This requires later travel if a termination in Britain is pursued and often can lead to longer recovery times as a result. This concern again links and mirrors the similar issues raised in RR and Poland where the court said it is important to be attentive to the temporal concerns of patients in this situation. And remember there, the court also noted that there does not need to be an intention on the part of the authorities to engage a violation of Article 3. So the time delay does not need to be intentional to be considered under Article 3. The final issue that our participants highlighted relates to state investigative actions. And this has two elements um, to it. So firstly, participants observe that healthcare professionals and patients are acutely aware that they may be subject to criminal charges for providing or accessing abortion provision, which is subsequently deemed to fall outside of the law. This raises particular issues for victims of sexual crime. So as the European Court of Human Rights made clear in PNS in Poland, a criminal justice system which punishes victims of sexual abuse is not Article 3 compliant. So while the criminal issues there related to underage uh, sexual intercourse, similar concerns may be raised in the Northern Ireland context should a victim of sexual crime be subsequently prosecuted for seeking termination services. The second element of state investigative actions participants observed was relating to stillbirths in Northern Ireland. So presently, all stillbirths must be reported to the coroner. And the view was expressed that this is significant for patients who experience uh, FFA, who travel uh, to Britain to receive feticide treatment and return to Northern Ireland. Parents of a stillborn child have the option to consent to an autopsy or alternatively a coroner's inquest uh, will be opened. And while many parents do consent to autopsy, those who do not have been uh, subject to investigation uh, involving the police. And concern was raised that police involvement in these issues uh, causes distress. Views were also expressed as to whether parents' consent to an autopsy could be considered true consent in a context where they are aware that an inquest will be opened if consent is withheld. So to summarise these findings and to draw them together, these issues indicate that further consideration of the current position in Northern Ireland under Article 3 may be required. While I'm not asserting that these issues demonstrate that there definitely is a violation of Article 3, what I am saying is that they signal that further consideration of Article 3 beyond the requirement to travel alone may be required. Our research with healthcare professionals indicates that there's a lot more going on in the ground in relation to treatment beyond travel alone. 
So as I've ha uh, highlighted, our, the research indicates that similar concerns as those raised in RR in Poland and PNS in Poland, where Article 3 was found to be violated, are also occurring in Northern Ireland. This is significant because Article 3, unlike Article 8, is an absolute right. States cannot derogate from it or qualify it. And so if a violation of Article 3 was found, this would be highly significant. So in terms of the consequences of the research, there are two elements to the consequences uh, that this research may have. First of all, consequences for the judicial review case itself. As I mentioned at the beginning, this case has been heard on appeal by the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal, and this judgment is awaited. And there's potential for this case to be considered further by the UK Supreme Court and even by the European Court of Human Rights itself. So on appeal, there may be scope to consider Article 3 further, including to pick up on some of those issues that I've highlighted emerging from our research with healthcare professionals. Secondly, consequences for domestic law reform. It's important that any consideration of law reform in this area at the devolved level explores thoroughly what is happening on the ground and addresses the challenges that are arising, including some of these issues that healthcare professionals have flagged. The issues raised by healthcare professionals are significant and must be taken into account in any consideration to change the law in order to bring into being a legal framework that is responsive to experiences of the law on a daily basis. Thank you.